Yeah, so my name is Olivier Legrain. I'm from France, uh, but I live now in Mexico for 10 years. Um, and well, I didn't have any other interests uh, besides martial arts when I grew up because I grew up in martial arts. I mean, my father was really into uh, martial arts in different kind and uh, different stage of his life. Uh, so uh, he started with uh, Vietnamese Kung Fu uh, because there was a teacher there uh, from Vietnam uh, and he was, it was very tough training. And uh, so I got into that, I think around seven or something. Uh, I didn't do that for a long time, but, but I like it very much. Um, and then we go on, uh, we went on doing more uh, martial arts, in particular one called Wajutsu, which <clears throat> in the end turned out to be very uh, a great martial art. Uh, but I, I, I really get into the, you know, the technique, the training, uh, the basics of you know Japanese martial art, and um, <clears throat> and I was really yeah I was really into that. And then my father uh, opened his own dojo, so I was the senpai uh, of the dojo. I think I was I don't know thirteen or something. So I had adults you know well below me as my kohai. Uh, so it was kind of a great responsibility. And uh, but the interesting thing and uh, well yesterday was reading an article by Donahue, uh, John Donahue, uh, and he was mentioning this thing that in martial arts, um, it's in the West voluntary. So people go to a class and they want to be, you know, they want to train in martial arts. And in Japan, uh, well, you don't have the choice. I mean, and if you're from the family of, you know, samurai or, or from the zoke of your school, well, you don't have the choice. I mean, you have to you have to do it, right? And and even if you don't like it, you have to get into it. So in a sense, it becomes uh, you never have the choice. Uh, you never have this uh, option of of dropping out. And, and I feel that that was a bit my case. I mean, not that uh, in any comparison with Japanese kids, obviously. Uh, but I never had the reflection. I mean, the thinking of oh yeah, well, if you know, if I don't like it, I won't do it. It was just natural. And, um, and I think uh, it forged my mind and my spirit, uh, you know, my will to, 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 to be good all the time and to, I mean, to perform all the time and, and to go through, you know, um, the training and uh, sometimes not willing to do it, but also, you know, to work hard on your body, to work hard on your spirits. And, um, so yeah, that <laughs> that was a bit. Uh, uh, I, I never had like any other interest uh, besides martial art until a certain point. But then it's interesting because I became fascinated by the culture of um, uh, America, and uh, and um, it was interesting because I grew up, you know, like in Asian uh, culture in a sense. I mean, we were surrounded by Asian culture. Obviously, I'm from a small town in France, so it's, it's not that, but uh, we were talking about all the time. I think I read Godin Nosho when I was 14 or 15, something like that. I didn't understand very much of it, uh, but the interest was there, right? So, um, uh, so yeah, that was a bit my childhood. Uh, and then when I, when I turned... Uh, yeah, 1820, uh, I had to go to the university and I had to stop, uh, basically, um, all the training. And, and I went to Paris and, and it was difficult to train. Well, so when you're growing up, it, it, you said that martial arts is like part of your childhood, part of just your everyday work. How did that show up in terms of your friends and going to school? Because you were you didn't have the free time anymore if you have to be at the dojo or you have to be... Uh, having this type of discipline? How did that show up in terms of your relationships with classmates or what you did as opposed to what other kids in that, in your town or city did? Yeah, well, obviously I was a weird guy. Uh, I mean, I had like some weird interest, interests, uh, but it didn't took me too much time. I mean, uh, the class were like, I think twice a week on, on the evening during the week. So, well, you know, uh, we we just go to train from no, I don't I don't know, eight to ten in the evening or something, 
And, and sometimes we had uh, training on the weekend or, or exhibitions. Um, so, yeah, no, so it didn't took me too much time away. Uh, although what I did, and I remember because of this interview, I, I thought about, you know, my youth. And, uh, but on the weekend, I, I would usually go train on, by myself. So in front of my house, there is like a dry uh, river. So it's like sand used to be. And uh, so I would put my gear on and take my book and, and, and go to train, I mean, whatever, because, you know, I was, I don't know, 13 or 16 or something. Uh, but I was really into like training by myself and, and you know, getting into uh, the spirits and, you know, trying uh, to, to get better and <laughs> understand, you know, the cuts, understand uh, the technique. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So you said that when you moved to the big city, when you went to school, you you were looking for a martial arts and you also had this interest in the culture and history of overseas places. How did all that blend together in, in terms of what you studied, in terms of other hobbies that you had when you moved away? Yeah, so it, it, it's funny because, you know, when we are 12 uh, at school, we asked uh, by the teacher, like, what would you want to do when you when you grow up and uh, and everybody want to be a fireman or a nurse, you know, uh, and, and uh, I came to the teacher afterwards and I said, well, you know, what I would really like is to go to Japan and to train with, you know, uh, the sensei and become a martial artist. And she looked at me like, yeah, don't you want to be a fireman and stuff? Uh, and and um, so it was kind of a silly dream uh, when I was, uh, young, uh, you know, because, well, I grew up in the 80s, I watched, you know, like Kung Fu movies and things like that, but I was really sincere in my, uh, in my will to do that. And I discovered afterwards that it is possible, actually, Baptiste Tavernier did exactly that. And I'm so jealous, but well, I took my own path in my own way. Uh, and, uh, but then, yeah, I, I thought, uh, when I think I was 14 or something, uh, I I wanted to be an anthropologist and I asked my father, what is, you know, the name of the guy who go in the Amazonia, you know, looking, studying people. And he said, well, no, 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 ethnologist. Okay, well, that's what I, I want to do. Uh, so then it becomes my own, uh, well, my own path, if you want to uh, go on with the Budo metaphor. Um, so then I, I really dedicated myself to that. Uh, I wasn't sure I would do it. So... So I go on uh, with the studies. When I was in Paris, uh, I looked for Yaido, actually. And I went to, I think, three dojos. But I didn't really look, I didn't really find what I was looking for. Um, because uh, in my uh, father's dojo, training was really strict. Etiquette was really strict. Uh, and we were kind of the spirits of, you know, samurai and Japan, although we had no idea what it was. But um, so when I went to other dojo and I see, you know, like loosey behavior on the tatami or in the, in the dojo, or people, you know, looking at each other and looking at themselves, you know, in the mirror with the katana, I said, no, I don't want to do that. I mean, this is not, you know, I, I wanted to find the right sensei and the right atmosphere. Um, to to get back to something I, I I knew when I was a kid. I mean, I don't know if it was really that because I was a kid, so maybe I fantasized about everything. But but still, I mean, when we do when we did um, exhibition with other clubs, you know, people from karate or judo, you see like people sitting, uh, you know, in every position, and, and everybody was impressed by the people of our dojo because of the this discipline and and you know the spirit we showed. I mean, we were really. Uh, I mean, we had a, a real compromise to what we were doing. Um, so then, it, yeah, I, I think, yeah, it, I took back some few years ago. So I, yeah, it, we, it's a lapse of 20 years. <laughs> but funnily enough, uh, so I found a sensei in Mexico, Genaro Sensei, that I think you interviewed also, uh, which actually fit my expectation. I mean, he's, he's a very serious guy and the training is good and you see the student, they're very motivated and very, you know, into the practice. 
And I say, well, okay, this is the guy. I mean, this guy I trust, and and I really want to, you know, to follow his teaching and and, and go on with it. And, and he's and I'm very happy with that. And um, um, <clears throat> yeah, what I wanted to say. Sorry. Uh, the funny thing is that you know, I've, even after twenty years, uh, I got back into the tatami. I started with aikido and, and iaido. And it was just like normal to me. I mean, I saw other people, you know, even if they had one or two years struggling with the position, with the, um, when you fall, uh, the falls, you know, uh, on the tatami and things like that. And for me, it was just like, you know, riding a bike, as they say. Um, so I thought, okay, well, you know, even after all this time, I think I still have the spirits and some of the intuition in my body. Uh, because what I think uh, this training did when I was young to me was really to train my body to have a proper understanding of my body. Um, you know, in the West, there is this very clear disconnection between mind and body. I mean, from the Judeo-Christian uh, tradition, right? Uh, um, and, and obviously in, the, in, in martial art, in Asian martial art, these, these things are, are, I mean, in, in Asian philosophy, in really, I mean, the conception of the body, both are really connected. So try to, uh, for instance, try to translate kokoro in English. You, you will see like spirit in, uh, or hurt or mind. And, and there is a reason for this uh, complexity in the translation is because it's the same. I mean, it's the siege of your will and your energy uh, is, well, part of it is in the kokoro, right? And uh, so I got that uh, really when I was young, and I think I got that all the way through, well, for now. Uh, so it, it was a good, very good training. So, so it was easy for me, in a sense, to go back to martial arts and, and physical training, uh, because I was very aware of my body. Uh, not that I was aware of it, but like seeing other people struggling, you know, with position and balance and things like that, I say, okay, well, you know, that was worth uh, doing that all my youth. <laughs> well, so certainly there is that um, body memory from your childhood, especially when you do anything very young, it really sticks with you, like learning a language or anything. Yeah. Um, in, in martial arts, we talk a lot about how what we learn and what we do in, in Budo can be transferred into our regular life. There's things that um, will help us act in different ways, even outside of the dojo. But similarly, there are things that we can do in our regular life that we can bring into the dojo. And when you say you have a 20 year gap between your practice, yeah, yes, there's a gap in the physical practice, but there probably is something either in your work or in your other interests and hobbies that have continued building yourself, building inside you so that when you went to uh, back into Budo, it's not like jumping in from when you were 14. It's there is something there. What would you say you learned in that time period? I know you're into culture histories and philosophy. What are like the specific things that you think have continued to stay with you even when you're not practicing? Yeah, I mean, that, that's probably why you're interviewing me. Uh, it's, you know, well, I, I have to go back a bit and, and so say something I, I actually never... Uh, confessed, and now millions of people will hear it. <laughs> no, but, uh, Fifty people. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, no, but something uh, that happened um, when I was younger. So I, my father was obviously a, a father figure. I mean, he was my father, but he was also my sensei. So he was really like the person I would, you know, admire and, and follow, you know, as... Uh, as the, as the as a man, an adult man, you know the person I wanted to be, and it turns out that uh, well, he, he he turned out to be a jerk, <laughs> um, and and all that his teaching uh, he didn't really apply it to his real life. So so he separated from my mother in very bad conditions and things like that. So it was a huge deception for me, uh, which is also probably a reason why I. I kind of stopped training. I mean, besides the fact that, you know, I, I, when I'm studying um, and, I, and where we were, when I was young, I mean, we had discussion, you know, like with other friends uh, until two in the morning about 
uh, you know, uh, philosophy, but it was like, you know, what they call Bushido um, and, and, and uh, New Age, you know, kind of stuff. And so I was uh, raised into this idea of, you know, karma and ki and, you know, astral energy and, uh, you know, all these things. So I, I know everything about this, this kind of stuff. Uh, from when I was young and but still when I was young I was kind of doubtful about that I mean I always had some distance and I was thinking yeah well I read some stuff and it didn't really fit with uh, with what I, I read or what I'm you know what I'm thinking when I in real life um, so when I because I became an anthropologist uh, and I went to work with the Mayan for well now 20 years uh, I really have a sense of what it is uh, to fantasize about another culture and, and being confronted to the reality of it. So when I talk about the Mayan and, you know, I work with um, uh, the, the, the um, like rituals and spiritual entities and, you know, the relation with the, the Mayan with the spiritual world and things like that. And uh, so people fantasize a lot, especially here in Mexico, uh, but for, you know, Mayan people is very practical. Uh, it's like, the same for Japanese, uh, uh, you know, religion, if you know a bit about it. And uh, so when I got back to that, uh, to the martial arts, and, and I hear people, you know, like, yeah, samurai would do such and such, or the spirit of the samurai is that. And uh, yeah, I never really believed that, but because I'm an academic now, um, the first thing I did was to read books. So I, I, I look for books uh, on the Japanese history, the the history of Budo, and then you know I came across very interesting uh, summaries of that, very interesting studies, and and it helped me really contextualize a bit the um, the practice into and, and separate the bushido from the bullshido. <laughs> um, so so I have this more pragmatic view and more cultural approach to to what is Budo, what is Japanese philosophy, what is, uh, you know, the transmission of knowledge through, uh, you know, schools, Ryuha and things like that. And I think this is what um, my, well, this gap in a sense or uh, in training uh, taught me like uh, to be very much mature, mature in terms of the understanding of the technique, uh, but also the philosophy. And, and I want to really strip out all these um, fantasy we have. And, and many people are, are drawn by that. I mean, they look at, they, they see manga or they do they, their sites, you know, like yeah, Mitama, Miyamoto Musashi said that, this and that. And I went through that when I was young. So now it's, 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 I know it's an illusion. And so we really, I mean, if I want to continue training and I think people will continue training, have to go a bit deeper than that. I mean, uh, in terms of motivation, is it enough, you know, this kind of uh, fantasy believing you are a samurai or modern samurai or you can apply all your training in real life? Um, I think it holds for a time, but at some point, you know, you have, uh, I've, I've, I think it, it, it wears out. So if you want to continue practice, you really have to get something which is more fundamental. I mean, um, the rock bottom of what is, you know, uh, Budo. Um, and I think what it is, is really in the techniques and, uh, and in the philosophy that underlines the transmission and not fi not fooling yourself about, you know, what it is you're doing. Uh, you know, because I'm an anthropologist uh, uh, and I'm going with the Mayan, everybody called me Indiana Jones, you know. Uh, <laughs> but it's... it's so it's it's interesting because I I, I can uh, I am well a lot of people are in the same you know uh, kind of situation but in my in my situation it's really the same that people think I'm going you know in the jungle and discovering you know uh, crazy stuff and the reality is I'm going to live for months in the village where you know I go to the field and I eat tortilla all the time and that's pretty much all and and with the the Buddha is the same I mean you think you're a samurai and and you dream about the Sengoku Jidai uh, and, uh, and the reality is you have to train and you have to forge your body and, uh, and it's not always nice and, uh, but through that you're going to go through a very deep discovery of your body of also what it means you know, uh, in terms of um, where we are in the history of Budo and, and what is our, our duty in a sense but also uh, what is our task you know, as Budokas 
So what's interesting about going into this level of detail to understand what is real and what is just someone hyping it up over time in fantasy, um, yes, it, it can it can clarify to you what Budo is about so you can see it as practical. But through the research, you must have also been able to see the depth of culture and history that are behind it. So it's not just a physical practice. There's also a lot of connection to what Japanese people were back then when it was created, what, the, what were their daily lives like, how did this kind of integrate more, more closely to their lived experience. So we, those of us that practice these in modern day um, don't get to that level of depth. Is there something that you can just quickly share with us um, as an overview of like, what did you learn? What were some of the things that is common misunderstandings that you can help reveal? What are things that surprised you when you really dove into understanding what these arts are? Yeah, I don't know if I will reveal anything, but I can make a, a quick summary of that. Well, I mean, if you look at the history of, of samurai, because uh, we have to understand that Budo is, is intimately linked to samurai until um, the Meiji era. Um, well, the Sengoku Jidai is actually uh, the, the real era where the samurai um, uh, became uh, a thing. Uh, but uh, you have to understand that at first, they were just bands of uh, warriors who tried to gain control of their territory. And, uh, and because the, um, uh, the imperial uh, army was um, cancelled uh, at the end of the A1 era, so around like the 13th century, uh, those guys were contracted, uh, and I'm not saying that me, I mean, it's a Friday's, Cal Friday studies, and I, I'm just making a summary. Um, so they were bands of, of mercenaries, basically, and then they gained over territories. And uh, and this, this kind of battle, you know, um, uh, I mean, went all through this uh, period in the 15th century of the, the Senkoku Jidai, uh, and then with uh, Sekigahara, so that the final battle that led to the peace in in 1600s, um, well, there was a, a peace time afterwards. So all those guys who went up and who um, became the samurai actually went out of a job uh, for 250 years. Um, so this is in the Edo period, so the Tokugawa uh, rule uh, that. All those fantasies about samurai, you know, arise. And it, what's interesting is that the Japanese people themselves, the samurai themselves, who were more uh, actually uh, people working in administrative position or, you know, uh, living the life, uh, an easy life in Kyoto, uh, fantasize about that. Uh, so it's not um, that, you know, there were samurai all this time. I mean, like the, the warrior. Uh, and interestingly, actually, during the Sengoku Jidai, uh, the samurai will use tachi, so a sword, a sword which is you know longer and, and you hold uh, in a different position. But uh, very importantly, uh, this is not the sword you draw and cut. Uh, so you have to draw it and then cut like you know medieval uh, European sword. And then because it was uh, very impractical, I mean it was practical to go on horse because those guys actually were fighting more with the bow. Uh, and arrow, and arrow, sorry, than the than the katana, which was really a last resort, recourse um, weapon. Uh, then it becomes, you know, the katana, so shorter. Actually, wakizashi was actually even more used for close combat because you were in houses and things like that. And and then there became this technique of you know drawing and cutting, which is well the basis of ei, ei jutsu, ei do. Uh, which actually, you know, apply to a very small portion of the population, which is like, you know, 10 to 15 percent of samurai. Of these people who were training in dojo, you know, very few actually engage in real combat. And it was, I mean, there was like uh, the UGI or Tari UGI, uh, like combat between schools and things like that. But it, it was not like a very widespread form of combat. Uh, so people had to invent and justify their position as samurai. Um, they had the obligation to train uh, uh, military by, by the shogunate, uh, and they get a stipend for that. So, so this is what they did. And then we come to the end of the Tokugawa period in the Meiji era, 
where people, you know, had to, I mean, um, Japan had to open these frontiers and get into and realize they were kind of a backward country, you know, I mean, themselves realized that, I mean, thank for that, obviously, I'm not saying they will, uh, but they realized, like, in terms of military equipment and, and, and you know, technology, uh, they were behind, so they really wanted to go on, you know, uh, through modernization. And what it meant is that, you know, Budo, Budo I mean, Bougay at the time uh, was not really... Uh, a, a nice thing. I mean, people were looking at those guys saying, well, you know, they have the past. I mean, like, we should completely abandon that. And um, and even, you know, the, in the Satsuma Rebellion, uh, the samurai, they went on with their sword, again, people with a uh, rifle, and, well, they were dead on the spot. So so they realized that, you know, using a katana is, is you know, kind of backward and, and, you know, thing of the past. And, and, and thanks to some people, you know, uh, Sakakibara or all these guys who, who turn it into a show uh, and and also um, people like uh, Karo Jigoro, uh, Kano Jigoro and um, uh, who actually took a step back and said okay well modernization is good but we also have to keep something Japanese with us and maybe this thing of martial art you know uh, many people are interested in that, and and it could be something to forge the mind instead of, uh, you know, being a thing of the samurai of a social class, um, and this is what they did, and through most efforts, and then uh, uh, a period which is uh, <laughs> usually not talked about by uh, martial artists is the period of militarization. So Japan, you know, be after becoming a very strong country and and getting up technologically, you know, even better than the US or uh, equal to European countries, uh, wanted to conquer uh, all, the, all Asia, basically. And they train uh, their children at school, you know, with Kendo and Naginata and Judo to be soldiers. So the, the martial art in this period, like from the 20s to uh, the end of World War II, was uh, in basically under treatment and... and uh, forcing children, you know, to become good soldier uh, of the emperor, and and I'm not saying it's good or bad, but it, that's the reality. Uh, and obviously, after the war, I mean, because of you know uh, American policy, this had to be stripped down. I mean, so the training has to go, but then they had to change all the philosophy, uh, which had uh, they had to go through like a huge effort, you know, to making something that had become very military, I mean, like to, to really train people to be soldiers, to be um, a, a self-development um, art and philosophy, right? And I think they did it uh, uh, in a very nice form. I mean, they really um, managed to keep some spiritual aspects to the technique, uh, to the, I mean, to the, the martial arts, uh, as well as making it a bit more... Um, uh, like a sport, uh, like if you see like kendo, I mean, even Yaido, we have competition. Um, so, yeah, so what I'm saying is that we don't have to get, um, I mean, it, it's usually bad to have too much uh, fantasy about what we're doing. So if we are aware of that, now we know a bit what it is, and then uh, we can really do Budo for what it is, um, and 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 be conscious of that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, well, one thing yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> sorry, one thing I have a question on how how the the Budo arts became what it is today in terms of like kendo, yaro, naginata, because what you were saying, like in the past, they were mostly either on horseback or in a, in an army. So their 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 techniques is not a one on one. Um, they're not training to do one-on-one -on -one fighting. And if they were in a house, they'd be using the, the wakazashi. So in terms of the length of the sword in kendo iaido, or the type of techniques, say, in, in naginata, th that was not even common back then. Like nowadays we can say, oh yeah, we're doing martial arts for the character building because nowadays with guns, you wouldn't use it, com you, can't, you don't use a sword in the street. But even back then, when these arts were popular and more and actually practical, you weren't using these current techniques either. You weren't actually doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one fighting. Most of it was either taught for for armies. Is that right? 
Yeah, well, it depends on the period, but uh, so there is the whole discussion which which goes on today about between uh, doing katas or uh, actual fighting, and obviously, so kata became a thing really after the the, the Sengoku Jidai, so after the peace and, and the Tokugawa, uh, so people who had like experience in combat, like Miyamoto Musashi or Yagimune Nori or the, all those guys. They say, well, okay, we have to find a way to transmit what we've learned, you know, through, uh, well, obviously it was very influenced by Confucianism. Uh, so through repetition and, and a structure uh, teaching the curriculum. And they invent, well, they didn't invent, but like they popularized the kata, uh, which can be like uh, one person or, or two opponents. Um, and, and so most of the transmission from, Ryuha, the, the various techniques, uh, went through that. Um, so people were training, you know, kata uh, on and on. And at some point in the... Um, and because, you know, the um, uh, the shogunate prohibited uh, musashu, musashugyo, so like going on training and, and fighting, you know, opponents and, uh, or taiji uh, ujiai, uh, fighting between schools, uh, well, they had to find a way to to test their abilities. And this is when uh, protection gear came into play and people wanted to, well, to fight, but without dying because, I mean, before they were training with Shinken, so, you know, one of them or even both, you know, could die in the in the attempt. So that was a one way, I mean, a one time, uh, a one time thing. So, um, so via school uh, started um, thinking about, you know, how could they train? Because we, even with Boken, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite dangerous. I mean, you can even die if, if someone, uh, you know, hit you with the Boken. I mean, you ask uh, Miyamoto Musashi's opponent. Um, uh, so, so the thing is like, yeah, they, they, they invented around like the, the 17th century, uh, what is um, now Kendo. Uh, and, and there was much opposition of that because, you know, people doing kata were saying, well, you know, it's not like real combat because you you lose the spirits of real combat because, you know, like the stakes are, are not too high. I mean, you won't die and, and you won't have, use the proper technique and things like that. And other people who wanted to fight, they said, well, with the kata, it's, it's, it's good, but, you know, you don't really get into like the, uh, the action and, and the, the real speed of, of, uh, of the battle, which... You know, this discussion, interestingly, started, yeah, uh, in the 17th, 18th century and, and, and goes on until now. You know, people doing kendo and not yai and people doing yai and not kendo and they're just like, no, no, that's a different thing. Um, and um, sorry, what was your question again? <laughs> well, I was just thinking, um, we were talking about the practicality of the techniques oh, yeah. that we're learning. Sorry, yeah, yeah no. Yeah. Another thing also is like we have the illusion that, well, you have to understand that many of the systems were in Ryoha, so in, in traditional schools, and there were um, uh, Sogo Bujutsu, so, so complete uh, martial arts, which means like if you do like Shinkage Ryu, you do like Naginata and Nito and you know, uh, sword training and sword against Naginata and, you know, uh, or Tendo Ryu, you have even. Um, uh, tanto uh, the, the 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 knife uh, versus naginata, so uh, it was more like a complex system of uh, uh, martial arts, and and this became uh, more and more um, uh, stripped down uh, throughout the years, uh, and, and some people just wanted to learn, you know, an aspect of the school. And uh, and Kenjutsu was a high, a very big thing in the in the Edo era, so this is why actually a lot of a lot of technique became uh, lost. So this transi- I mean, this transmission has been done mostly through uh, small families, uh, family lines. Uh, some people opened their dojos, but it was very limited to samurai. Some people would come uh, uh, in the countryside, you know, who were not samurai. And after um, the well during the Meiji era uh, and, and uh, the, the beginning of the, the 20th century, uh, this was diffused to school. 
So now everybody would, you know, go through kendo training, and every girl would go through nata, naginata training, and and so this is how it became uh, it became a thing. And after the war, obviously, we all became uh, voluntary. I mean, now you you can choose, you know, the arts that fit that fits you. <laughs> Does yeah. it answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, it talks about yeah. My question kind of was how these techniques were continued well like because they learned so many different things how did they choose mm -hmm. these current ones to continue on to today and whether or not they were practical back then i think you helped answer that question i was just wondering now because you you didn't you started investigating these things through uh reading books as you were saying because you're an anthropologist but you also started back your practice with an arrow sensei and then uh you pursued kind of this intellectual kind of quest even more can you talk about what made you feel like you needed to do more than just read books about it to actually go to places and talk to people and how has that changed your view on on the martial arts even more yeah obviously i mean uh, uh Martial art is practice. I mean, you, uh, you can read all the books you want. I mean, it's it's good for you for your knowledge, but it it's you won't understand um, what it means in terms of like spirits, uh, mental attitude, uh, and philosophy, and obviously a practice. I mean, like the body, what is implied, you know, during martial arts. Um, so I, I I wanted to well, since I'm a kid, I wanted to go to Japan because like that was like the, the mecca you know for me uh, but i didn't want to go to japan just to go to tourism i mean I'm, uh, i wanted to go with a goal and uh, so when i was uh, doing a postdoc in the, in the netherlands we had a lot of money so i could go anywhere i want and i was always looking for like any kind of excuse to go to a conference in japan but it didn't happen so so i couldn't go it would probably was a good thing i suppose uh, in the end uh, so so then i started doing yaido and kendo and I, I was yeah i should go to japan i mean now i have to go to japan right i mean even i'm very i mean i still very uh, uh, like a beginner but you know i want to know the real thing because in the end that's that's kind of like the real thing or at least you know i want to see what it is uh, uh, really and not living through illusion uh, and, and i want to experience this by myself i mean i have to say that all this uh, way is very individual i mean i'm not i don't want to do like proselytism or, or you know to to convince other people of that i mean this is my own quest you know and, and my own justification to go on uh, doing something and i want to understand what i'm doing that's that's my only motivation really i mean i hope i can i can teach you know in some years and and, and kind of uh um spread this understanding of martial art if if it's relevant to other people um so i went to japan uh, and uh, thanks to the sensei from from chile uh, i asked him i went to my wife from chile so i uh, i went there and then i realized that was uh, my sensei sensei so I thought, well, okay, that's a very nice coincidence. Thank you, Destiny. Uh, and uh, so I asked him, you know, how can I go to Japan and train? Because I heard that you had to go to through connection. I mean, you cannot just pop up to a dojo in Japan and, and ask for training. And he said, well, you should go to the International Buddha University. Uh, and I say, well, you know, I'm I'm an adult and I work, so I cannot go like you know through a full year. So can I go a month and a half? Uh, so I took a month and a half from my work, uh, and uh, unfortunately I work at home a lot. So so I don't. Uh, I kept on working and I didn't tell anybody, and I went there. And uh, but was that was a fantastic experience because I really was uh, well. I didn't expect anything, so I wasn't disappointed in a sense. Um, but I really understood that the training in Japan is very different. So it's very stripped out of all this mythology and, uh, and people are very concerned with the technique. And, and what I realized, um, and I'm thinking a bit more now and, and listening more to senseis, is that this thing they're, they're trying to, I mean, what is their 
transmitting. So people with very high rank in, in Soke, I had the, ch the chance to train with uh, Kimura Sensei, which is the Soke, who is the Soke of uh, Tendo Ryu. And those guys, then they don't feel themselves as you know, like superhero or modern samurais. They are people who are worried and people who are very concerned about their duty because they were handed a tradition of 400 years uh, you know, and they have their ancestor looking at them in the kami of the dojo, like, and so they look at each student and they're thinking, well, will I fail, you know, transmitting what I know? And, and so for me, that was uh, a real uh, revelation in the sense that those guys, they're very preoccupied with tradition and, and culture, which as an anthropologist, you know, I'm, uh, very sensitive to, <laughs> uh, and you see transformation and Budo has transformed a lot. And, and, and one key of its survival has been transformation, but through, you know, some kind of also tradition and something which is anchored, uh, in, 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 in the practice, we'd go back to like 400 years in some cases, 450 years. And, um, so the training was really interesting and, and, uh, the teaching was also interesting. Uh, and, and because I don't want to make the same mistake as I did as an academic, um, learning, but I'm also learning how people teach me. So uh, I'm learning, you know, the fundamentals, but I'm also trying to learn how to teach if, well, I, I, w I would like, you know, in some years to open a dojo, uh, not, not because I want to be a sensei or something like that, but to have like a community which responds to, to something I'm more interested in. I don't know if it will be possible at all, but but it was really interesting to see the difference of teaching uh, also in Japan. So this is a, good, a very important part of, of the expectation you have and the understanding you have about what you are doing. Uh, so in the West, typically, I mean, like, yeah, broadly, uh, people talk a lot. And, and I had a discussion with Baptiste Tavernier uh, about that. And they said, well, you know, it's a two hour training and they talk for an hour and a half. And, and in Japan, they barely talk. I mean, you have to try and you have to get through um, understanding through your body. Uh, and so I remember I sent to my sensei in Japan from Yaido and uh, like the, the 12 kata, you know, from two angles and things like that. And, uh, you know, and I said, well, can you, you know, give me some correction? And he said, well, your back foot is not straight. And that was it. And, and it's, you know, what more can I tell you? I mean, if your back foot is not straight, you know, until you get that, well, you next, you know, uh, uh, when you get that correctly, you know, I will teach you something else. And um, instead of, you know, saying, well, you know, your little pinky should go outward and your hand and your, uh, you know, the look and things like that. Uh, so that was really interesting and very humbling uh, because you have to go through, I mean, they say to you, you know, um the discovery of of the technique of you know the proper technique and the, the feeling and the and the mentality of the technique does not lie in me as the teacher to to give it to you. It, I'm just like setting up the right conditions so you have to train and you have to come to enlightenment by yourself. Uh and yeah I mean that's that's difficult. Uh but that's that's something I I, I try to think a lot about and because also I'm doing psychology and cross-control psychology uh, I have some notion of of that so one is affordance and affordance means uh, this is a bit what you know archaeological um, uh, people who are doing like experimental archaeology do so they, they take two stones and they try to reproduce you know uh, an arrow from you know 10,000 years ago and there is not a hundred way to do that. There is like, you know, one or two proper way that you're gonna get this particular result because of, you know, the size of the stone and the material of the stone. And, and so with Budo is, I think it's really anchored into that. I mean, your body function in, a, in, a, in kind of a unique way. I mean, if balance, if you don't think balance is in your belly, in the hara, um, it's very difficult to to understand the movement if you don't think about your hip uh, and you think about your foot or you think about your head. I mean, you will never get you know this proper um, movement and balance you have. Uh, the the way the katana was designed, actually, I read that and, and I and I look for that. Uh, 
the fact that it's um, you know uh, bended uh, how do you call that uh, curved curved sorry the fact that it is curved and and uh, it's only one um, cutting area actually uh, well as the benefits of you know you can slash and thrust uh, and it's very good on a horseback but also uh, and it's a very interesting point is that if you let him find its proper position uh, in a sense uh, the cutting edge will always uh, be up or at least you can always feel the cutting edge you know leaving the the sword you know getting its proper position in the hand and uh, and so this is the kind of detail you know if you pay attention to your katana uh, that you will at some point <laughs> you will understand you will understand that you don't have to to apply brute force and and to you know swing your katana it's more like the katana will get into the position and and you are the instruments of your weapon uh, and actually uh, thinking like that in naginata for instance it's obvious i mean you cannot swing a, a naginata i mean you are not guiding the naginata naginata is here and you're helping the naginata getting it in its proper way Otherwise, you know, you're dumb to be like very slow or you to fail. So this is the kind of stuff like Japanese teaching is is much more concerned with. Like you have to practice and you get you have to get through the understanding of the weapon uh, uh, and of your body and the technique through yourself through experimenting, and not so much about intellectualizing, which is a problem for me because I mean for the teacher they're just like yeah yeah, yeah stop thinking just concern on uh, you know. Just do your thing and don't look too much, you know, around. Don't uh, get too deep into like the understanding. And so I have this tension, you know, uh, personally about like being an academic and being a budoka, a proper uh, kohai. <laughs> yeah, that must have been so so weird for you because you purposely went to Japan to get a better understanding. And when we think about understanding, we mean in the head. So you were maybe when you go to a university, you expect they'll just tell you stuff and then you're like okay I'm I'm capturing all that information but then you step onto the dojo and you get virtually nothing from the senses you're just there to practice first question would be how did you arrange for a month and a half when normal people have to go for like a year program and then what were the days like when you were there like did you spend some time doing actual academic study and then also practice or were you how were you spending like say a week what was it like so to go to the university you have two options to i mean the uh, ibu the international uh, university either you go to do like the proper curriculum and you have a diploma in the end and, and it's one year or two years or three years um or you can be um, a trainee i think it's called i'm not quite sure uh so you're invited for um like a few weeks or, or you know the time you want uh, and obviously you just an invited uh, student, you can do whatever you want. Well, to some extent, uh, but you don't get anything more than just you know going there. I mean, uh, I don't, I didn't get a diploma or anything, obviously. Um, and um, so I, I got that through an invitation, and uh, so the Asansei ask Kanera um, Sansei if you know he could receive me, and they say yes, and in the university they say yeah, of course you can come, and they were very kind actually. Uh, so I spent my days in the, at the university and the weekends I, I would go to Tokyo to train um, Iaido and, and Tendoryu. Uh, well, in this case, Naginata, I, I didn't get to, to do more than that. And uh, well, they were intense uh, because you you start at seven uh, in the morning because I was doing Kendo and Iaido. Uh, so seven in the morning, it's like Kihon, they say, well, it's it's already kind of dreadful and then I think at 10 you have another class of kendo and at 2 in the afternoon and at night I would do iaido so I did that uh, uh, like the first few weeks uh, but then I broke my foot um, so so I couldn't do kendo anymore actually I broke my foot during uh, uh, so giddy <laughs> Uh, and, and I heard like, uh, so I was, yeah, doing a proper te uh, teisaraki, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, so I, I, I ended up uh, doing only uh, Naginata and Iaido. Uh, Kendo was out of question uh, for me, so it was a bit sad, but well, it was a good experience. In, uh, in, 
but the, the the training is dreadful. I mean, and you know, I'm 40 years old, and those guys they're 20, 25. So in Mexico, I keep up with the young guys. I mean, not not, not too much problem because they're not in very good uh, physical condition. But there, I mean, they're just like beasts. I mean, they're they're doing that all days, and and this for them, you know, it's like a, a proper uh, training school, you know, for athlete. Uh, so there is like also like baseball and other stuff. So those guys, they really think that this is what they want to do and they want to be, you know, like the champion of Japan and things like that. So they're not taking that lightly. Right. Uh, so, so it's very, it was very interesting to train with them, but uh, I was not in, in, in very good condition, unfortunately, but I hope in the future I could go, you know, two or three weeks and, and, and be a bit more prepared for that. And, uh, but the, the classes also in Tokyo was very interesting. So you don't train, you know, in a fantastic dojo and things like that. It is, you go to train in, uh, they have, they have these public, uh, buildings for like a different kind of training. So this very nice, uh, um, room, you know, for like kendo or yaido, things like that. But then you, you get there, uh, you have one hour or two hours. So you have to be like ready when the other people get out. You have your two hours, and when your two hours uh, end, you have to go out uh, all the time. I mean, like super rapidly. So, I, one interesting anecdote uh, for that is that you always think, like, you know, Japanese, they're really into ritualistic uh, things, and you take their time and meditation and contemplation and things like that. And, and it's absolutely not like that uh, uh, for the training, at least. So, you have to hurry up all the time between and after the training. And that's I mean, for me, that was really kind of almost annoying. I mean, I was kind of upset because I was just like, okay, I will take my time, you know, to play my hakama very nicely and go to the training and put myself into the mentality. It's not like you have to go, you have 10 minutes. And you're just like, okay, well, I have to do everything in 10 minutes and be prepared. And at the end, it's the same. So it's kind of like rushing and then a period of calm or training and then rushing again. Uh, so, so it was interesting. I mean, different rhythm and different understanding of uh, what training is about. So you have to take all the advantage of the time you have uh, to properly train, which I liked, actually. <laughs> Yeah, and and the interesting thing, like I want to ask you, is that most of the the people that go to the International Budo University, they they are more they are they are younger, so they're like students. They go there, they practice, they learn something, and then on weekends or nights when they don't have practice, they just go hang out with other kids. But as an older person going, how did you structure your off days? Like, did you did you set up meetings with people to discuss other things? Were you having, or were you just enjoying the time there and going to uh, sightsee? I don't know. Uh, no, I didn't. Uh, so, I, because I, I, I went, be, I mean, in my period of, I mean, in my working days, uh, well, I still worked uh, the time I had, I mean, I would sleep because I was, it was dreadful. I mean, so I would sleep all the time and, and work on my things. I mean, like my papers or the thing I had to do. Um, and on the weekend, as I said, well, I would go to train the, on the Friday evening and the Saturday. And uh, so I would just go, yeah, sightseeing a bit in Tokyo uh, on, on Saturday or Sunday and come back and that was it and at night well i was i was not hanging with the kids because uh i was doing yaido so the only time for yaido club which was me basically literally <laughs> uh besides the tuesdays i mean all, all the other days it was just me so i had like from i think yeah eight to ten every night uh i had the dojo for myself and it's a beautiful dojo i mean it's, it's fantastic uh, the the floor is amazing, so I was just like, no, I mean, I would train every day. I mean, I would, so I, every night I would go, you know, dressed uh, with my yaido gi, and uh, the other kids would just like, yeah, well, this, this guy is crazy, you know. And so they were just enjoying themselves, and I would go to train, and uh, and because I wanted to pass my EQ there, uh, yeah, which is not a big thing in Japan, but for me it was like the most amazing thing. I would you know, pass the Yaido grade in Japan. And, uh, and and I went to the Tokyo, it's not the Budokan, this the other one, like the one with the 
the triangle. Uh, it's called also Budokan, uh, Tokyo Budokan, I think it's called. Uh, so it was just like amazing. So I would have to try, I was training like crazy, uh, the five first kata all the time, all the time, all the time. And um, so, yeah, so no, I didn't have like uh, much social life over there. <laughs> Were there anyone that you got to know while you were there, anyone that you had good conversations with, anything you could share on in terms of... Yeah, there is an Australian guy uh, I keep in touch with, uh, and we train uh, Jukendo together uh, with Baptiste. Uh, so we had a very good time, and, and we talked, to, but yeah, we didn't talk too much. I mean, those guys, they were, they had, I mean, I, I was a tourist there. I mean, those guys have crazy days. I mean, they start at seven and they, they end up... I think their days yeah go up to five in the afternoon or six in the afternoon. They have Japanese, they have Japanese history, and they have I don't know four classes of kendo and another optional class. I mean uh, it was intense. So so everybody was a bit tired, you know, at the end of the day. And it's not like we had like tremendous conversation through all night. Um, but uh, and the other person I met, which was a, a fantastic meeting. I mean, I, I, and we keep in touch all the time now. Yeah, is Baptiste Tavernier, which is also a Frenchman. Uh, so it was easy to communicate with uh, because I didn't know Japanese. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, and, and and we talked a lot about uh, yeah, what is Budo and uh, and because we're both French. Uh, we have this kind of cynic view of, on on everything, and but that is even more than I, you know. Like uh, so, all this illusion about you know, like samurai and Japanese people and things like that. I mean, he lives in Japan for he has he has been living in Japan for I don't know how many years, maybe twenty years. Right? Uh, so it was interesting to have this point of view because he's very. What I like about him is like. Uh, he's very cynical about, you know, more, uh, what Budo uh, administrative, you know, like organizational thing is, and uh, but he's probably one of the most dedicated people I've I've seen when it is uh, when it comes to actually practice. And, and when I say practice, I mean I don't want to say that, you know. I, I think about Budo as only a, a practical or physical thing. I mean, it's a spiritual thing and it has to be a spiritual thing. So uh, having the proper spirit is, is very important. Um, what, I, what I'm just talking about is not being in the illusion that when you have, uh, when you put on the Bogu, you're like a, a samurai, you know, with the Yoroi. I mean, it has nothing to do with that. Uh, it's like you have to be, you know, uh, having a proper speech like Sotemi, you know, like being able to be quick and, and, and throw yourself into the combat and things like that. I mean, these are, I, I think, personally, the, the real value of, of, of Budo. So there is a spiritual aspect to that. And, and he has... Um, he has that. I mean, he, he's very stripped down into like uh, you know a bit uh, disillusionized, but but very acute in in what should be the spirits of uh, the technical practice and why is it you practice it, and and it was a good role model. It was a good. Uh, yeah, a kind of opposite, you know, model for me uh, to, to draw from. I mean, then, you know, everybody has to find their own motivation. Everybody has to find their own um, uh, interest in what they are doing, you know, and, and to go on doing it. Uh, so you have to take from different models uh, of people you practice with or you learn from. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of this trip was to just see more, to, to really feel what it's like in Japan to get it straight from the source when you come back, how has that changed how you treat your practice now or how, your view of Budo and where do you see it going in the next year or so? Well, I don't know if it changed really my practice because I was always focused on, you know, I practice a lot at home, uh, which I noticed, I mean, uh, to my surprise, actually not many people do that. So they just go to train during training uh, but I think that's a mistake. I mean, you have to train by yourself uh, because everybody has different uh, weaknesses uh, and different things to work on. So, so if you don't train by yourself, uh, I mean, you won't evolve uh, 
rapidly at least, or, or you won't, I mean, you will miss some, some things, I suppose. Um, so my training, yeah, was more focused. What, what I got from, not so much from my training, but from the understanding of how to teach. Uh, so for instance, uh, many teachers in Japan, they look at your technique and they show you what you're doing wrong which I never, never, never see in, in, in the West. I mean, I don't have a big experience, but I've been through yeah, uh, uh, a lot of, I mean, I know a lot of people. And so what they, 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 they show you what it is. So again, the focus on the body is, is really important. Instead of, you know, verbalizing everything and exp trying to explain or going through small details. So they say, oh, yeah, Olivier San, uh, uh, so you do like this and... Uh, you know, and he exaggerate the posture and you're just like, oh, okay, now I, I can feel it. I mean, you don't have to resonate and think about it. You have to understand what is the sensation you have to have or what you're doing wrong. And, uh, and I like that very much. And this is something if in the future I can, you know, teach other people and have a dojo and things like that, I would like to mix, uh, obviously, something from the West because you cannot just have like a proper... Uh, Japanese and I, I, I wouldn't be able to do that probably um, but uh, yeah to have this focus on more the the pedagogy of uh, uh, Japanese teaching uh, uh, on Budo uh, that's mainly what I took from the um, the trip uh, to Japan and obviously learning a new technique because there is some stuff you cannot learn if you don't go to Japan. I mean, Tendoriyu in Mexico, there is no Tendoriyu. Uh, Jukendo, there is no Jukendo. Uh, so all this um, Naginata, there was uh, we're, we're starting with the, the Naginata here. So uh, really what I wanted is to get more involved into learning proper techniques and proper styles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that what, what you shared in, in this interview so far is when you think about something that you want to learn more of, that you want to know more of, you have to, you have to get instruction and then you have to practice it. You have to go do it. So in the sense of like when you said you can study archaeology or anthropology or whatever through a book, but you actually have to be on the ground, interview people, try to fit the pieces together. Same thing in the practice. You can read about techniques, but then you have to do it in, in the dojo and actually run it through. And I think if you take the same approach to starting a dojo, it's the same thing. Like, I want to learn what it is to be a teacher. I want to learn what it is to have a responsibility of a dojo. I can learn it in a book. I can watch other people or I can just go do it to figure it out. And I think that that approach and what I'm hearing from you is what you want to do. It's not about being the instructor. It's not about being a leader and having people listen to you. It's just like, how do I, these are people I look up to. These senses are something that I want to achieve myself. The only way I can do it is if I practice it. So I need to start a dojo. And I think because of that approach, because of that thinking, uh, I have no doubt that you will succeed. Uh, like you, you're questioning whether or not you will be able to do a dojo. I know you will be able to do a dojo. I'm telling you now, I'm calling it in 2020, December. When that happens, um, pay up. Uh, <laughs> I'll be your manager. <laughs> You're going to start a dojo and, and we'll see that happen. So it, to wrap this up, just a couple mm -hmm. of quick questions to get to know you from a different side. Um, uh, and this is something I ask pretty much everyone. Do you have a quote or a proverb or something that you enjoy or listen to or think about? Well, I'm a bit ashamed of, of, of telling that because I actually I took it from uh, uh, Bennett Sansei, who got it from his Sansei, but I like it very much. Uh, which means like uh, when you don't sweat when you're a kid, uh, will transform into tears when you're an adult. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I don't know, I heard like many quotes, you know, like everybody has their quotes and I heard that and I'm just like, yeah, uh, I think I wasted, you know, 20 years of my time not doing Budo and, and I should, you know, now I'm, I'm on the other side of my life. I mean, like the second, you know, I'm going down. So I really want to try and, and uh, uh, every time I don't want to go to kendo training, you know, or something, I think about that. Okay, well, no, I should. I don't want to live in regrets, uh, so so it's important to do that. Yeah. <laughs> mm. 
<laughs> okay, so another another question would be this one. What have you changed your mind about in the last few years? Something that you believe deeply that in the last few years you realized, oh, I was wrong or I was misunderstanding a concept or something was not right. Some what did you, what have you changed your mind on? Well, I, I think I don't know if I changed my mind on, but I realized uh, that you know, learning about Japanese culture and and, and samurai history and, and Udo, Buge, Ujutsu, whatever, um, that history is complex, uh, and uh, and we, I was more you know living in the illusion of a void of what is really, you know, Budo and what is really Japanese culture, martial art, Japanese culture. And, uh, and in the last years, I really, I'm really happy to have been through all this training and all this reading to get a proper understanding of what it is really. So then if I want to understanding, if I want to go on with it, you know, find the motivation to do it. And then well, maybe at some point, you know, have, students who can practice with me and have like a community, uh, I think going to the source and understanding what it is really uh, is fundamental because you don't want to cheat yourself. Uh, you know, it's like in the matrix when you all feel like the two pills, yeah. you know, you can go on living in the illusion or you can go through, you know, what it really is. So, so then you have to decide if it's really what you want. And uh, so people are upset, you know, sometimes when they say, well, you know, when, you know, people, other pe people say, well, you know, it's not really that. And, you know, you're kind of living in, a, in, in an illusion or something. I don't mind. I mean, if people want to think they're samurai and that's good. What my wonder is like how long this will last, you know, for them to get motivation from. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this is the realization I got. And I'm very happy in because I'm a, uh, I'm a curious person and hence I'm an academic. Uh, I cannot do something and I, I don't understand fully. Uh, so, so, so I'm very happy to go through that and understand also when you learn, you know, tradition, I mean, katas that are 400 years, you have to understand what is the weight of history uh, and, and other people have been through and what was the motivation of those people who, who wanted to transmit that because then you become, um, you know, uh, so an ambassador, uh, ambassador, ambassador, uh, of this, I mean, like you, you have a duty in a sense. Uh, so, so it's important not to fool yourself and, and to respect and understand what is the tradition and what you're being uh, offered with. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, no, that's such a great lesson because uh, we we realize too as we get deeper into practice that there are questions about the physical uh, techniques or just concepts that you have to go to that depth. So just like your thing, if you don't sweat, if you don't learn these things as a younger person or in your early days, in your when you're Shodan, Nidan or whatever, when you get to these later levels, you just you still have to do it. And now it's a lot harder to build that back up. I remember the quote. It's um, the, the number one best time to start anything was 20 years ago. The, the second best time to start something is today. So uh, that's a good quote. I like it. Yeah. 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 Uh, so let's switch things up uh, to a little more casual. Uh, what's your comfort food? Uh, pasta. More detail. What kind of pasta? Oh, pasta. Well, uh, it's well any kind of pasta uh, with oil and uh, cheese and parmesan cheese, or and that's it. Oh, yeah. very simple. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> If someone were to log into your YouTube account, um, on the homepage, YouTube recommends videos to you based on what you've watched in the past. What are videos that someone would see YouTube recommending for you to watch? Yeah, well, unsurprisingly, uh, like Budo, like, you know, Saido page and uh, all this uh, Kendo world and things like that, but also Japanese history and uh, car reviews. <laughs> I like to watch. That's it. <laughs> nice. Okay. Uh, so, um, I think that's that's good. So, in wrapping, do you have something that you want to say to the audience? A message that you want to share based on 
the things that you've said today or just some, something that you've thought about a lot recently? Well, just clarifying one, again, clarifying one, one idea is that um, uh, when I talk about like stripping down, you know, all the, the, the fantasy of the, all the illusion around uh, Budo, I don't, I don't want to imply that it's only technique and it's only technical because this is another mistake uh, uh, some other people do like, well, you know, young guys doing kendo, they just focus on the technique and, and, and winning the, the competition. And, uh, but we don't really want that either. And, and of course in, in the, um, that will get you, you know, through a certain amount of time, but when you're 80, you know, this this won't be the motivation uh, to go on doing uh, budo, practicing budo. Uh, so there is a spiritual aspect, and uh, but um, it it's really linked for me. It's really linked to the 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 way you perform the technique. So in the eye, for instance, if you really don't think the kasoteki is uh, another person that could have been you, I mean, your adversary that you're killing. And and this time it was him, but it could also be you. Uh, you know, you don't have the spirit. I mean, it's not like just doing the kata. We, we don't care. I mean, it doesn't really matter. I mean, doing the kata, you can learn that in, in two weeks and, and that's it. I mean, like the fact that you have to understand the proper training, you have to be in your body, you have to show the proper uh, mental attitude, uh, like spiritually, but also um, the concentration and things like that. These are the things that are very important. Uh, and and obviously, well, there is a bunch of, of philosophy that existed uh, through the time and uh, that has changed. So if you look at the Edo period, there is like some mysticism uh, and magical stuff, you know, uh, taught also by the, 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 the people, you know, having those real, uh, but this, you know, changed over time or actually weared up uh, but what is really at the heart of it is like this combination of proper mentality, proper mental attitude and, uh, and the body. And this is why I think Buddha was so successful all over the time and could reinvent himself, even after the war, you know, when it had to directly change to let's kill half of Asia to uh, universal peace and love uh, for humankind. Uh, because I think in the end, you know, like the spirits and the way you manage your energy and your body and, and your and your mental attitude is really at the heart of uh, Buddha practice, uh, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> no, thank you. This has been such a fascinating conversation. I'm so glad you agreed to, to do this. Um, thank you. Yeah. All right. Cool. Thank you so much for your time. Um, oh, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, I hope we can get in touch. Yeah. All right. Bye. Bye. Cheers.